Election Day 2020, the day that Americans get to decide who our leader will be for the next four years. We should never, ever take that for granted. How few countries relatively in the world get really to pick their own leader. We get to pick our own leader. And I have to tell you, looking back at my year, I'm very proud of the fact that I defended the president against charges that would have led to his impeachment and removal from office. How much better is it that we, the American people, get to decide whether President Trump continues in office than a few handfuls of senators and a few hundred congressmen get to decide that decision on partisan political grounds. So it's election day. We will soon know who our leader will be in the next four years. And today, we have a special privilege. We have a guest who is remarkable, a young man named David Rubin, who has one of the most successful uh, podcasts uh, in the world. People from all over the world listen to him. He has uh, millions of uh, viewers and listeners, and uh, he is consented to be on this uh, show. And I'm gonna ask him some hard questions. He's a conservative, I'm a liberal, we agree about free speech, we disagree about some issues. So you're gonna hear my questioning of David Rubin on The Dirt Show. It's a great honor to introduce a man who I have long admired, even though he's a very young man, uh, Mr. Podcast himself, the man who has the most listeners, the most, he's just everywhere, and uh, his views are so interesting and so fascinating and often so unpredictable that he fits perfectly into the Der Show, uh, David Rubin. Alan, it's good to be with you. That is, that is quite an intro, Mr. Podcast himself. Now I feel like I really better know what I'm saying for this next duration of time. I'm gonna, I'm caffeinated. I'm gonna give you everything I got. Oh, well, you heard, you ain't heard nothing yet. Let's begin with, of course, the most important part of your life, and that is where you were born in Brooklyn. Is that right? Yes, I am an old timer, born in Brooklyn on June 26, 1976. I think you'll appreciate this. My bris was on July 4th, 1976, which was the bicentennial of America. So maybe that does explain some of my political leanings after all these years. I grew up in Long Island, uh, lived there uh, till, till college. I went to SUNY Binghamton. So I'm a, I'm a true New Yorker Great. in that regard. And then I lived I lived in Manhattan for about 15 years, and then and then I moved to LA in 2013. So I've only lived in New York and California, and yet the people who seem to appreciate what I talk about live in the middle of the country. It's a bizarre situation. Well, that's very typical. You know, throughout uh, Jewish history, we've had uh, Americans writing about the Midwest. Uh, what was my favorite comic growing up in Brooklyn? Archie Comics. Archie Comics yeah. was all about, you know, the quintessential American family in the Midwest written by a guy named Goldwasser. Uh, yeah. You know, v v the, the music of, uh, uh, of America, so much of it, uh, uh, Copeland and, and, and uh, others uh, who had never even been. Al Jolson writes about the Suwannee River. He wouldn't know the Swanee River if he tripped over it. I mean, George Gershwin wrote that and Al right. Jolson. So, you know, Jews from Brooklyn and New York have a way of universalizing. Now, I want to first of all ask you what neighborhood in Brooklyn you were born in. I was born in Bensonhurst at, I believe it was Brookdale Hospital, which I, I don't know if it still exists, actually. I'm not sure. Maybe it's still there. But I was yeah, only there until well, I, I was I about three or four. Well, look, everybody's entitled to one mistake, moving from Brooklyn to Long Island. Uh, I know a lot of people who did that, and you're forgiven. Um, I grew up in Borough Park, right next to Bensonhurst. Mm -hmm. I used to go and watch uh, Sandy Koufax uh, play basketball uh, at Bensonhurst at the Jewish uh, uh, Center. And then he moved to Borough Park, and I watched him play basketball, and then, of course, baseball even in Los Angeles. So, you know, our Brooklyn roots are similar. And it's interesting, I think our journey is a little bit similar as well. I'm told you started out pretty much as a liberal Democrat. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, like most sort of New York Jews, the second thing, you're a Jew and you're a Democrat. And that just is what it is. And that was very much how my family operated. But 
you know, in a modern sense, you know, you say liberal to people and they, they don't know what you're talking about anymore. So when of I try yeah. to explain to people, and you, you know all about this, of course, when I try to explain to people, oh, well, I'm an old school liberal, the way that Daniel Patrick Moynihan was a liberal or JFK was a liberal, meaning they didn't want the government to do everything, but they, they felt there was a role for government and they believed in individual rights. Uh, and they certainly didn't believe in, in the crazy collectivism of the left and sort of the modern liberal. Uh, it's hard for people to understand that. And that's actually why, you know, as we're taping this, it's election day. And I'm really, really curious to see what happens with the Jewish vote this time that goes so heavily Democrat all the time. And I think there's going to be a big split. I, I think there's a couple groups that we're going to see unprecedented splits with. I think the Jews will be one. Um, I think the black vote is going to go incredibly high to Trump, it's shockingly high. Uh, I think the Latino vote is going to split in an interesting way. I think all of the minorities that unfortunately the Democrats have used as monoliths are finally realizing that that isn't how it operates. So when you say, oh, well, you're an old New York liberal Democrat. Well, I grew up thinking that Mayor Ed Koch was was a basically a good guy and he had to govern a city of eight million people from every walk of life and and did that pretty effectively at least maybe not to the end but but for most of those years and those type of democrats are gone i mean show me can you name one i i can't name one one sort of centrist blue dog democrat you know i think they're trying to smuggle biden in as if that's what he <clears throat> is but i don't even well, think i can biden give you one he is at this point I can give you one from New Jersey, uh, Josh uh, Gashheimer, uh, who is in Congress from New Jersey. I think he would qualify as an old line liberal. Look, when Schumer was first elected, he looked yep. like he was going to be that, and he certainly has moved away from that. Uh, I wrote a book this past year called The Case for Liberalism in an Age of Extremism, where I lay out in the book what is liberal, and it's almost precisely what, what you have defined yourself as. And today, there are hardly any liberals left. You know, back in the day, I used to debate Bill Buckley. I was the yeah. moderate liberal. He was the moderate conservative. We would have these ferocious debates, and then we would go out and have a drink. And uh, today, you know, I have members of my family that won't talk to me because I represented President Trump in, in impeachment, even though I voted for Hillary Clinton. So, you know, we live in such an incredibly divided world. As far as the vote's concerned, here's my prediction. I think the Jewish vote will divide along two lines, uh, orthodox generally, generally, mm -hmm. and the further to the right will vote for Trump. But I also think that if you did two polls, one, how important is Israel to you on a scale of one to 10? The people for whom Israel is most important, I think many of them will vote for Trump. For people for whom mm -hmm. a woman's right to choose abortion, gay marriage, a range of other social issues are more important, probably will vote the other way. Well, let me ask you a personal question if you don't mind. Um, sure. I wouldn't raise this except that you are publicly, you came out as, as gay and you're married. And uh, don't you appreciate the fact that Democrats did that for you and that that's kind of a liberal thing and that many Republicans would oppose your marriage and would oppose your freedom to do what you want in your life? Yeah, well, it's an interesting question, and I, and I get some version of this a lot, as if, and I know this isn't what you're implying, but the, the question always comes with this piece of, don't you owe these people something, that, that somehow oh, no, they no. did no, something? No, not at all. So I, I know that's not what you're saying, but that usually is what people are sort of saying behind the question, is don't you somehow owe them because they did this thing? Now, first off, I'm gay. It's probably the least interesting thing about me. I, I've been with my husband for 10 years. We've been married for five years. Um, we, I would say this, that... If liberalism is getting equality for everybody, equality under the law, equal protection under the law, as the Supreme Court case laid out, well, then I am thankful that liberals have often led the fight on that. And of course, liberals have led the fight when it came to civil rights and women's rights and gay rights and the rest of it. So that is that old school liberalism that we're talking about. Now, once you get equality, well, I, I'm appreciative of equality and as, as black people are appreciative of equality and, and women that couldn't vote are appreciative that they can vote now and, and everything else. But you don't, you don't owe any political party anything for I doing agree. the right thing. Now that isn't to say, isn't to say that, that do I wish the Republicans 20 years ago had taken a more libertarian approach on this, which by the way, they basically do at this point. I mean, Trump, has completely obliterated the idea that the Republicans really care about gay marriage. Now, there are some 
Christian conservatives who do. Obviously, someone like Mike Huckabee has his own personal faith than he does. And, and by the way, Ben Shapiro, an Orthodox Jew who I'm friends with, has his own personal religious belief. And I'm, I'm OK with that. But the more that they take the libertarian approach, which is, OK, you're, you're an adult, that, that guy's an adult, you can enter the same contract that anyone else can enter. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I think George W. Bush got, got screwed up in that re-election year by trying to make gay marriage a wedge issue to really get the, the evangelicals. And I think that really screwed up the Republicans. But look, the, the simple fact is when, when people change, you have to give them room to acknowledge, you have to acknowledge that change. So you have to give them the room to change. And, and the Republicans have changed here. Rick Grinnell is, was the ambassador to Germany, the, you know, the temporary head of national intelligence. Mm -hmm. He's openly gay. He's a good friend of mine. He's an evangelical Christian and, he, and, and a Trump supporter. Uh, Peter Thiel, there, there are plenty of these types of people. Yeah, and yeah, it's just yeah. unfortunate that the, the left thinks they own you just because of that. Look, I, I have to tell you, I have more respect for somebody like Huckabee who expresses his views honestly and directly than I do for Barack Obama, who simply yeah. looked the American public in the eye and lied and said he didn't support gay marriage. Of course he supported gay marriage. Yep. Uh, it didn't take really Joe Biden making a slip up the, to say, I club, support, yeah. for him to evolve. I mean, he was just a phony. He was making a political point. Bill Clinton, uh, similarly, uh, likewise on issues like the death penalty, where uh, liberal Democrats didn't have the courage of their convictions. And at least some conservatives stand by their views. and and defend them. I find it indefensible not to support gay marriage or support gay equality. And I am worried that the Supreme Court with the newly appointed justice, who is very highly qualified, but has views which we'll see whether she allows them to influence her decisions, may well set back the rights of women, the rights of gays. So uh, how do you deal well, with how do you deal with that, with the Supreme Court issue? And by the way, in answering that question too, where do you stand as a libertarian on Roe versus Wade, on a woman's right to choose, a woman controlling her own body, et cetera? Yeah, so it's interesting. So, so in my book, which came out in April, I also laid out the defense of liberalism, and yet Vanity Fair just Great. did a piece on the, on the conservative books that made the New York Times bestseller uh, this year. And of course, they included me, and I said to the interviewer, you do realize I was defending liberalism, but they don't they don't really care about that. But well, liberalism your, your is now a form the, of con, is now a form of conservatism. It, if you're a real old fashioned my, liberal, you are now a conservative. As I've been saying for about two years, defending my my liberal beliefs is becoming a conservative position. So in many ways, I don't Absolutely. mind. I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't. If someone says to me, Dave, you're sort of a new conservative, I, I actually am OK with that. And let's not forget. You know, people like Rudy Giuliani, who at one time was the front runner to be the Republican nominee, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, he's he's pro-choice and he's been for gay marriage forever and everything else. But to directly answer your question on the court, when it comes to Roe v. Wade, and I am pro-choice, I, I believe first trimester and then and then we do have to have some regulations. And this is one of the ones where the left has just gone bananas, where eight months you can have an abortion and they'll discuss, you know, they'll discuss post-birth abortions and some really crazy stuff. Um, I do have that let's put it this way if roe v wade did get flipped meaning and, and and a lot of people you know this a lot of people think that roe v wade legalized abortion which obviously isn't what it did but it made it federally legal of course well the the state's rights guy that's in me the libertarian and the small government guy i don't know that i would have much of a pushback a, a sort of intellectually consistent pushback against that. That being said, if it did, I wouldn't call for it to be reversed. I, I suppose I would prefer that it wasn't at some level, but if it did get reversed, and let's say a, a small handful of Southern states reversed abortion, what I would then say to the progressives is instead of now telling us why you have to burn down the system and pack the courts and destroy everything here, how about start some nonprofits to make sure that a young person that needs an abortion or wants an abortion, however you want to word it, can get across state lines and it's going to be taken care of and paid. Yeah, and but let me, let me ask you, do the work? That, that, yeah, that's a fair point. But would you apply the same approach if the Supreme Court overruled the gay marriage and gay rights cases? Would you say it's yeah. for the states and if there are just a few states that uh, criminalize and put people in jail for loving somebody? who was of their own sex, 
Would you say that's okay? Let's progressives move to those states and try to get them to change their views. Or would you say it would be a terrible thing, a terrible thing right. for the Supreme well, okay, Court so not to require there, recognition of gay marriage all over the United States? Right. So there are a couple of things there. First off, a recognition of gay marriage is very different than, say, jailing somebody or fining somebody for, for engaging in, in a certain behavior. So let, let's no, I don't think anyone right now the, is calling but for the that. Feder, so but the federal issue, but the federalism issue is yeah. the same. Uh, yeah. You would you allow would you allow a state to criminalize gay activities in the uh, in the name of federalism i don't think you would would you no not no not gay not gay activities but i'll answer the i'll answer the marriage question directly but not no if two consenting adults want to in the privacy of their home do whatever they want to do then we we are a place of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and you are allowed to engage with but how would you distinguish that you from so, abortion? How would you distinguish that from abortion? So, if a husband and well, a wife decide they want to have an abortion, why doesn't the same argument that gives you privacy rights uh, as a gay man give a woman privacy rights to determine how to deal with her own body? Why would you make well, a distinction so let, let, between those let two me answer, let me, Yeah, I totally understand the legal distinction. Let me let me answer it from the gay marriage perspective. So when, the, when gay marriage sure. was... So when we had those two or three years where it was the hot topic and it was happening state by state, I was actually completely okay with it happening state by state. I actually felt that was probably the best way to do it. And it was probably the most mm -hmm. legally secure way, because that's really what you're asking me is have, have right. they done this now in a legally secure way? So I was fully okay with that. And, and, and it was happening, by the way, like dominoes. Then it got up to I the agree. Supreme Court. I agree. And, and I believe it was, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was Justice Stevens who basically said uh, under the, what was it, the, not, not the Equality Act, well, the Equal Protection Clause, right? So he said that right. everyone is, is protected equally under the law. So now, first off, I don't think that a case will get up there get all the way to the Supreme Court, where then the Supreme Court, even though it will be leaning conservative, obviously, will say, we are now going to take away rights from people. The Pandora's box of issues relate, are we gonna force people to have divorces? Are we gonna put, you know, separate families and all these things? The, the craziness that that will unleash, I think the court, I, agree. I, I would be shocked absolutely shocked so so i don't mind answering the question but i think when a lot of people ask it it's it's a little confusing as to what what the court does the court has consistently i think i'm talking to the right guy when i say this so correct me if i'm wrong the court has consistently expanded rights for people can you think of instances where the court has taken away rights and then and then led to just cascading issues that we can't even fathom what those issues would be actually well, the only area that I could think of would be voting rights, where I think there have been a constraint on some voting rights issues, but they're close questions. I agree with you. When you get to rights like the right uh, of privacy, generally we've moved in an expanding direction. And I think the framers of the Constitution intended that. Look, there's, there are dead parts of our Constitution. You have to be 35 to be president. And then there are living parts, equal protection, due process. Obviously, mm -hmm. those words were invitations to adapt to the new realities of the new age. I, I tend to agree with you that I don't think the Supreme Court is going to get in the business of undoing rights that have been established for many, many years. But when you do have some people on the court, uh, Justice, what worries me a little bit about Justice Barrett, just a little bit, is she wrote a Law Review article in 1998 in which she talked about how as a religious Catholic she might have to recuse herself if her own religious fundamental views uh, that are basic mm -hmm. to her religion clash with the Constitution or clash with American views. So if you, and you get her and Justice Alito and Justice Thomas, you could begin to get a core of people who are, who are unable to separate their religious views from their constitutional views. So I worry about it, and that's why I remain reluctantly and cautiously a liberal Democrat, because I'm trying to keep my influence in the Democratic Party to marginalize the extremists. And I get the question every day, how come you haven't become a Republican? And sometimes your name is mentioned and my former, our former student Ben Shapiro's name is mentioned. Why haven't you become the elder statesman of these young, terrific, uh, new, uh, often Jewish, uh, former liberals who have now recognized the reality that liberalism has become conservatism? So that's the question I'm asked a lot as well. 
by the way, I, I totally respect your position on that in that you're trying to still save it from the inside. And, and people, I think one of the things that people like about me is I have been so open about my political evolution and literally, you know, as it's election day today, yeah. you can find me roughly four years ago and two months or so supporting Bernie. So the videos that I, as I was waking up along the way, it's, it's all out there. And what, what I've, the conclusion that I've come to for, for people that are sort of in our position is that I think at this point, I can do much more from the side, I'm not a Republican, but I can do more by talking with my conservative friends and making sure that, that we carve out that good space for liberalism and the agree to disagree portion, Look, which they're willing I, I to do by the that. way. And, and I, but I respect I, your position of saying, I'm gonna try it here but but as you said, you're, you're going to lose a lot of party invites, and that's just okay. reality. But I don't get them either, so it's that's, okay. Uh, that that's fine. I've lost 15 pounds on what I call the Trump diet. Nobody invites me to dinner anymore, so I'm a lot healthier. But let me tell you one point. I respect you enormously, but you just said one thing that re really has made me lose some respect for you. So please, uh -oh. please tell me why I should respect you for having ever supported Bernie Sanders. He is the one candidate. If he got nominated by the president. Uh, to be president, I could not vote for him. How could you ever have supported Bernie Sanders, a man who went to London and campaigned for Jeremy Corbyn? Explain yourself, sir. Alan, I appreciate yes. the lawyerly way you asked me that question. I was wrong. <laughs> Three words. I was wrong. And that's exactly okay. what All I right. write about. All that right. We're friends essence... again. We're friends again. <laughs> Listen, in essence, when 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 progressives, when the progressive movement really took fire, say six or eight years ago, and the Bernie thing started catching on and all of that, progressives seem to me, and I think to a lot of people and still to young people now, the reason that we know these are bad ideas, but why do they seem to work for a lot of people? Because you don't really have to think about them, right? It just sounds right. Free college for everybody, free health care for everybody. We're going to take from the rich. We're going to give the poor. If you yeah, don't think yeah. about it, other than that very thin veneer, well, but, then it all it all sounds good. But, but you're a person you think who thinks about, about everything. But you're a person you know, who thinks I, about everything. You've always thought about everything. How could you have not been thinking? Here's you talk about the progressives. They wanted to deny yeah. us our free speech. They still want to because they think they know the truth about everything. What do you need to have dissenting opinions? They want to deny due process because they know you're guilty if you're accused by a woman. Women don't lie, only men lie. Why do we need process? Why do we need free speech? How could you have ever fallen into that kind of illiberal trap which by people who call themselves progressives but really are regressives? Yeah, you know what? A lot of it had to do with the fact that they were the ones screaming the most about gay marriage. So this sort of does get to your ah, earlier question. Okay. That one that one affected me directly very much. And we're all just products of, of our own selves as well, right? Like we're products of society and then our own internal things as well. And they were screaming about it most. But I would also say this, that as as bananas as the left has gone now, and Bernie is the is the thing that caused it. He was not obsessed with identity politics. And I don't think he was really fully understanding of the Title IX stuff that you're referencing about due process. And I don't think he really understood what was coming with critical race theory and all that. He was just an old school, big government socialist or, or a big government yeah. Democrat, right? And, and I think what happened is he gave that thing the veneer to then bring in all the really terrible ideas. And that, that really explains my evolution because once I started seeing it with him and then you saw the stuff coming behind him, well, then, then it leads to exactly where we're at right now. So what, where are we going on free speech? Let's assume hypothetically that we learn that Biden becomes the president and the Democrats take over the Senate and the House and people like AOC and uh, Lana Omer and others who are repressives who couldn't care less about free speech, who are, we'll get to in a minute, to Israel and other values. Where is free speech going if the Democrats assume control over, all th three, over, over two of the three branches of government with the judiciary still being, for at least some years, under the control of people appointed by Republicans? Where, where is free speech going? Listen, I, Alan, I think you know me well enough to, to know that I, I'm not an alarmist. I, I do my show actually to, to calm people down and to talk them off the ledge and try to think about these things in somewhat of a sober, realistic way. But I, I really do believe that if, if Biden wins, it's not because of Biden. He's just the host. But the parasite that is in him, 
that, that leftist Marxist AOC, a Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib thing. That's where the energy is. And by the way, when you reference Chuck Schumer before, you said, well, he was sort of an old school liberal, but the reason he's gone so bananas, or Dianne Feinstein, the reason that they've gone so bananas, Nancy Pelosi, because they all know what the energy is. And they also know, by the way, that the second that they turn against it, if there was one thing that they wanted to say that was anti-woke or, or anti the progressive movement, they know what would happen, which is they would be called a racist and a grifter and a sellout, which by the way, when Chuck Schumer came out against the Iran deal, they tried to destroy him. It was his own people, as opposed to saying, okay, we have one Democrat who doesn't fully agree with us, which would have been well, nice. You know, why he came been out. you know why he came out against the Iran deal? He came out against the Iran deal because Obama gave him permission to do it because Obama didn't need his vote. Where do you think Schumer would have come out if he had been the deciding vote on the Iran deal? I think he would have come no, out in so favor I get of it. Obama. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, so I, I totally get that. But that goes to show why it's almost impossible in the modern Democratic Party to, to hold a position that is counter to where the energy is. So as for what no, I, I think will happen, Look, if I Biden experienced gets it. in. Yeah. No, if, if Biden gets in, I think we I think that first off, he won't be president. I mean, I, I just don't think he will really be president. I think that he will not be the decision maker. I'm not saying that Kamala will be the decision maker. I don't know what that machinery is, that DNC machinery, or whether that's the Clinton machine still or the Obama thing or, or whatever. And I, I don't like going down conspiracy routes. But in effect, the future of the Democratic Party and what they will lead, it will truly lead to the destruction of every institution we have. The school that you love, Harvard, the way it's struggling right now, the way the undergirding of the university is struggling under all of these things, the way critical race theory will be put back into the federal institutions. They'll bring back Title IX and get rid of due process. They will try to get rid of the Electoral College. The, every, everything that has existed for 250 years that we have expanded upon to make stronger and better will be under attack. Every, every statue will be got, will, they'll go for every statue. They'll go for the Obama library one day when it's completed because he was against gay marriage the first time around. So they'll destroy themselves. But the question is how much of everything else good will they destroy at the same time? No, I, I agree with that. And I don't love Harvard. I fell out of love with Harvard when they fired the dean of one of the colleges, Ron Sullivan, for having represented Harvey Weinstein. Uh, Harvard is uh, falling into the trap of listening to the extremists, to the Cornell Wests, and to the others. Uh, and so, um, you know, I don't love institutions. I love liberty and due process, but uh, I've never been in love with any institution. Every institution is deeply flawed. Let's turn, because we don't have too much time left, to, um, to Israel. I don't know whether you speak much about uh, foreign policy uh, generally on your podcast, but um, what do you think the Democrats are gonna do in relation to Israel? For the first time in our history, well, we're seeing an effort to eliminate bipartisan support for Israel by the extreme left of the Democratic Party. You think that will t that, that will influence Biden if he's the president? Yeah, well, first off, let me say I'm, I'm a huge supporter of Israel, and I believe that the Jewish people have the same God-given right of self-determination that, that any other people have. I thought you were uh, an, I, I thought you were an I thought you were an atheist. I'm a retiring atheist. No, I'm, I'm more of a believer uh. now, actually. I'm more of a believer now probably than any, well, certainly than any time in my adult life. Um, but that, that's a, we could do that on a, on a different show. When you, uh -huh. when you come on okay. my show, we can, we can unpack that because it's an interesting discussion about how Jews talk about God and belief is very different I'd than love, the Christian I'd notion love of to belief. do that. I'd love yeah, to and do I, that. I've written three books on it, and I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a self-doubting agnostic, so we can talk about that, too. Right. Uh, well, look, so Albert often Einstein has a leap of faith. Right. <laughs> well, I think that's very consistent with sort of a modern Jewish perspective on God. That that happens to be different than the personal relationship of God that comes from the uh, the Christian tradition. But that let's put set that aside for a moment. Um, but my but even saying what I just said about that, I believe that the Jewish people have the right to self determination. That you could be an atheist and believe that, of course. I mean that that this sure. people who share a culture and a history and an identity deserve a place on earth just like everybody else. So I would say I'm a huge Israel supporter. It doesn't mean Israel's right all the time, obviously, but it's this absurdly right. tiny piece of land in a really tough area 
that has thrived and, and you know, made the desert bloom and all of those things. I think it's, it's extremely unfortunate that the future of the Democratic Party will be rapidly anti-Israel. I mean, think about it this way. In the Democratic primaries, uh, they never asked about Israel, but Bernie managed to bring Israel up in almost every debate and, and usually to attack Israel one way or another. What's coming behind, you know, AOC, who refused to go to Yitzhak Rabin's memorial a few yeah, months ago yeah, yeah. what's and and ilhan omar ilhan omar the one place she wants to boycott is israel she can't find one other country right. she wants to boycott right. what's coming with them is is really evil and it's wrong and look the, trump trump has done more for israel uh but without without much of a cost you know what i mean he he encouraged other countries to say hey let's normalize relations let's not have war let's and by the way i do think that there are probably over the next couple months if he remains president there will be some more of these countries coming around. And, and in essence, no what he proved is that, is that Netanyahu was right all of these years, that you need to deal with the other countries, deal with some of the economic stuff, the trade, all of that. Let's normalize that. And then you deal with the Palestinian stuff, because no matter what we offer them, they have their own issues and, and Hamas and the PA and all that. So let's do it outside, and then maybe that'll pressure him. So there's a lot of good things happening. And until Trump started doing this stuff, I thought we all wanted peace in the Middle East, but apparently not anymore because it has something to do with Trump. But, but today with the Democrats, I can't even praise Trump today for moving the embassy to Israel, for recognizing the Golan, for helping to create normalization with Israel's previous enemies. Uh, that is regarded as treason to say something good about somebody who the, uh, is so strongly hated by Democrats. But I'm going to continue to say good things about presidents I may have voted against and bad things about presidents that I voted for. Uh, I think Obama did an abominable job on foreign policy. I voted for him twice, uh, particularly in the Iran deal and that UN resolution at the end of his term. And I'm going to continue to attack him and continue to praise President Trump for what he did on Israel. And I'm going to get hell for it. And that's what's happening to America. You've got to pick sides. It's like the Red Sox and the Yankees. You can't say anything nuanced about the person who is on the other side. Are we ever going to get out of that, do you think? I don't know that we'll ever get out of it, but, but let me just quickly, 30 seconds, just tack on to one thing that you said there. The, the fundamental reason that they hate Israel is because Jews are supposed to be victims. That works for them, and they love victims. Yeah. There's nothing that the left hates more that, than a group that says our victimhood doesn't matter anymore. A group that was pogromed and holocausted throughout time that has 5,000 years of a, a horrifically brutal history, yet we're still here for some reason. And, and especially the Israelis, well, they're Jews that have guns. They're not victims anymore. So you have to hate yeah. them because the left needs their, their victim groups. And now, wait, sorry, what was the question? I was really going deep on that one. No, 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 that was, uh, that, uh, that was exactly the question. And the point is, how does one preserve bipartisan support oh. for Israel at a time when it looks like the hard left of the Democratic Party is moving strongly away from Israel? I don't sense that bipartisanship is coming back anytime soon. And, you know, it's funny that we're doing this on Election Day because we just simply, I, I tweeted this out this morning, but the, sim the, the true truth is that nobody knows what's going to happen tonight. And in a weird way, while that, while that feels very scary, it's also really inspirational that we live in a place where anything can happen. That four years ago, mm -hmm. the guy who you may not like the guy, but the guy that everybody said can't, couldn't do it, he did it. He did it. That's an mm -hmm. incredible thing. I think, unfortunately, though, the, the idea of bipartisanship is, is gone for now. I, I think the new world, uh, in a weird way, because of big tech and social media and all of us just sort of going off into our corners, which is a very sort of human thing to do at some level. It's a dangerous thing, but it's also a, a, a protection thing. I, I don't sense bipartisanship coming back. What I do sense, though, so if you want the silver lining on this, is that if my calculation is correct and the, the good liberals that say shift rightward or, or more try to operate within the conservative movement, as opposed to the ones that stay and fight, and again, I, I totally respect your decision to do that, I sense we can create a really big tent over there because I meet mm -hmm. people that call themselves conservatives that are pro-choice. I mean, you know, the gay marriage thing, as we said, the ship has sailed on that. There, there are, there's a debate within conservative circles. Not every conservative is even for the death penalty. 
there, there is an openness there. And then when you show also, well, hey, we're also the ones for school choice, as opposed to Gavin Newsom, who doesn't like school choice and sends his kids to private school. And, and when you expose that hypocrisy, I think the mountain that you're going to have to climb is, is almost insurmountable. It doesn't mean it's not a worthy adventure. Uh, in many ways, maybe it is the most worthy adventure. Uh, but I, I think that that side will continue to shrink and that the right, in essence, will just keep broadening the tent because they're going to say we just don't care about the immutable stuff. Come here and let's debate. Well, that's and a, that's what America is. That's a, a perfect lead into my final question because we're running out of time. And that is you have become a very, very important person in American culture and politics at a very young age. Uh, what is your future? Uh, are you going to remain uh, in the media? Are you going to continue to expand your influence? It's very important that you have this influence uh, to so many people on, on a daily basis. Are you going to move into politics? Are you going to move into some mixture of politics and the media? What is the future of Mr. Podcast, David Rubin? <laughs> Um, you know, I really love this. I, I genuinely love this. You know what I mean? I, I grew up, my, my dad has probably all of your books. So I, I grew up flipping through your books. The fact that I get to talk to people like you, that I, I toured for a year and a half with Jordan Peterson, you know, the, the leading intellectual of our, our time, that I've sat down with some of the world's most influential atheists and believers, and I've talked to great libertarian economic, economists and, and lefty economists. And, and because of that, I think I've been able to, to bring in a lot of good ideas. And it, and it doesn't mean that I'm an expert in every one, but I think I can communicate a lot of those ideas, at least the important parts of it, to people that have to go out there and have a job and have a wife and have a kid and a dog and a car payment and everything else. And I think that's what, I think that that's what sort of my role in this is. Um, I don't think that me shifting towards the purely political end of this, meaning running for something is really where I could do the most good because, because clearly this thing has worked and I want to see, I, I love the fact that I built two businesses and we employ people and we treat our guys great and we're, we're building something together. I, I love that I didn't intend on becoming a businessman, but that happened in the midst of this too. So I don't know about pure politics, although I suppose there could be a situation where I'm, I'm here in Los Angeles in California that this city just crumbles to the point where maybe like a mayor situation, but I can't even believe I'm saying that out loud. It's so crazy. But my, my policy would be basically, listen, I can't fix all your problems. We're slashing all the budgets. You, have, you get some of your money back. Uh, let's see what happens. That would be my policy, basically. Well, you don't have to worry about saying it out loud because you've only said it to me and I don't have as many viewers or listeners as you do. So that, not, Come on, Alan. maybe you can change that. Maybe you can change that and, and get me some more listeners and viewers. But I'll see what in I any do. event, uh, uh, you are you really are the future. And it is so encouraging for me on Election Day to hear your voice and the voice of other young people on both sides. Uh, my hope is that we can build a centrist uh, model, uh, closer to the center, uh, eliminating, marginalizing the extremes. The, the conservatives and the Republicans have done a much better job marginalizing their extremes, their Pat Buchanan's, yep. their some people on the other side than the Democrats have done. So I praise the Republicans for doing that. And the more voices like yours we hear, uh, the better. You have any closing words for our listeners and viewers on The Dirt Show? Yeah, well, Alan, I'm, I'm thrilled to have this conversation with you, and I, I look forward to, to doing it again. Um, but, but I really love this concept that, that people like you and I, we have a generational divide, right? You're, you're a boomer. I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer. But we've come to a, a conclusion boomer. Are you about kidding? the I'm a, I'm a pre-boomer. I'm a pre-boomer. I'm 82 years old. I'm a pre-boomer. I'm a post-World War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the greatest. Wait, that's the greatest generation? You're on the young side yeah, of the greatest well, generation, I'm, I'm, I guess. I, I'm kind of in between the greatest generation and the boomers. You know, born in 1938. Okay, so you're, yeah, you're, you're right on the cusp but, there. But really, think about how, how cool it is that, that people that, you know, we have, you know, roughly 40 years almost between us. I'm 44, so we have almost 40 years between us. Um, we, we have a similar worldview, and yet what we said here was that the, the tactic of how we want to move forward to fight for that world that we want to help create, that will increase freedom and increase liberty and all those things, our tactics are slightly different. 
and it creates a different set yep. of challenges for both of us. But I think if, if you can be somewhat successful and hold the ground with the left, and I can help the conservatives, you know, open open their minds a little bit, well, then we've done the thing we'll, that you just we'll talked save about, the which world. is that the center- We'll save yeah. the world. Hey, I got nothing better to do. Okay. Hey, what a great, great opportunity to talk to you. You're a hero and you're done, you've are you done such great work. And it's always a special pleasure to talk, somebody, talk to somebody who was born in Brooklyn, even if you left early. I still am going to regard you as a, a Brooklynite forever and ever. So thank you again. Listen, I've got a Brooklyn Dodgers show. cap. That counts as something. It does. And I have a Brooklyn Dodgers ring from the 1955 World Series, which I treasure. So you oh, can man. take the boy out of Brooklyn, but you can't take Brooklyn out of the guy. So I think both of us have a little bit of that in our in our hearts and souls and uh, continue to do great things. Thank you so much for honoring me by being a guest on my show, The Dirt Show. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much, Alan. Please call 24-7. The number is 216-710-0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call 24-7 is 216-710-0050. Hard questions, criticisms, everything's fine. Just keep your questions short and I'll answer them all on The Dirt Show.